just I want to thank some people who've helped me with my research over the past two or three years. Jessica Wilson, who I think I saw come in um, from South Kingston Public Library, has been really helpful. Uh, the Rhode Island College Adams Library, which uh, has provided me with both images and text. Rhode Island Historical Society, um, and the University of Rhode Island Libraries. And I, I settled on a complicated heritage because everything about the hazards is complicated. And Caroline Hazard wrote a book called A Precious Heritage, which was about her family, mostly about her parents. So when she died, the New York, she got a bigger obituary in the New York Times than either of her brothers. Uh, her brothers, one of whom uh, ran the Peace Manufacturing Company, one who ran the Solvay Process Company in New York State, they got a paragraph. She had a full obituary treatment with a photo in 1945 when she died. And they called her America's foremost woman educator. And at the time, she was in her late 80s and she hadn't worked at Wellesley since 1910. So that tells you right there how lasting her reputation was. Unfortunately, she has sort of faded into obscurity now. Uh, so, so who was Caroline Hazard? She's probably most famous for being president of Wellesley College from 1899 to 1910. She was a writer of history. She was a poet. She wrote some short stories. She wrote a number of books, mostly around her South County heritage. Uh, she was a, actually a fine watercolorist. I'm going to show some of her paintings today. She was an intellectual who had a lot of influence over public thought, and she was a philanthropist. And that's really sort of our focus today. And as we talk about her philanthropy, I wanted to unpack why did she give to the things she gave? Like what, what values was, were behind that? And I separated out uh, four or five groups of things that she was very interested in giving money to. But there's a lot more to her than just having money and giving it away. So she was born June 10, 1856, sandwiched between two brothers, uh, probably closer in childhood to her brothers because there was such a gap between her and her sisters, uh, particularly between her and Margaret or Margie, the youngest of, of the siblings. So, so she was almost like a third son to her parents. She, and, and in life, she lived like a man, she lived independently, she traveled independently, she never married, she never had children. I think she identified with her brothers. I think she was the smartest of the five, and it was a bright family. She was really a brilliant woman. She had a great deal of executive ability. She had, uh, even though she wasn't educated in the traditional sense of having a college degree, she was, she had a very sound background in terms of you know, the classics and reading and travel and whatnot. So first we have to talk about the hazards. And, and she, as she was born and as she was raised, the hazards were already having this profound impact on the community. The Peacetown Manufacturing Company, of course, started in the early 1800s by her grandfather. Uh, and, it, and that's sort of the engine that's driving, you know, this is where the money is coming from, right? Uh, so we, we, all you have to do is drive from Pista, right, to see all of the uh, things that the hazards gave to South County, to South Kingston. Uh, this is a wonderful sketch of the mill that the artist Mar Marjorie Vogel did. She did a series of sketches. Of, uh, she did, you know, that wonderful Main Street Wakefield poster. This is one of, one of her works. So they had an impact on religious life. Uh, you know, her, her father gave the Peace Stone Congregational Church, which started in, in their home in Oakwoods. Uh, they built, built the church in 1870 to 1872. Uh, you know, still a major force of community religious life in South Kingston today. And then they had an impact on civic life. They built what was called the townhouse or the town hall. Uh, this was her grandfather's donation in 1877, before he died. Uh, you know, it's still in use today. You know, most of these buildings are still in use today. Has a memorial hall which houses um, the Peacedale Library, the Peacedale Branch of the South Kingston Public Library. This was originally, it had an auditorium. It was a place where they showed plays. They might have music house. Uh, it was a real sort of an artsy community center in addition to housing the library. And the Neighborhood Guild, this was her, uh, her aunt, Augusta, who really um, was behind this. 
Think about all the ways in which the Neighborhood Guild is still at the heart of community life. It started out as a place where the mill workers could go to get sort of enrichment, take classes and whatnot. But you know, now we have, certainly we have the Recreation Center, we have other things, but the Guild is still a very important part of our civic life. And Hazard School next door, and, and the school that was there before, the high school that was there before, those are also gifts of the hazards. So, you know, starting with when she was a teenager till she was an, a, an older adult, the town is, the, the hazards are still giving buildings to the town. So we have to, we have to put some context into the hazards. You know, it's very tempting to just talk about them as this, oh, this great, beneficent family that gave us all these things and left us these wonderful buildings, weren't they wonderful? They had a complicated relationship with slavery. Uh, she liked to talk about how her grandfather's grandfather, College Tom, refused to hold slaves. But the truth was that the family profited from slavery at an arm's length because they were manufacturing so-called Negro slave cloth right up until the Civil War. And that's where a lot of this money was coming from. So again, we have these, we have these contradictions. You know, we have the sort of abolitionist side of the hazards, and then we have them literally selling this rough slave cloth to the plantations and making money doing that. Uh, and you know, Tia Miles wrote this book called The Things That She Carried, or All That She Carried, which is a, a, about Ashley Sack. It's this, uh, this, this mother, this enslaved mother, gave this sack to her daughter because they were being separated, they were being sold away from each other. Uh, and it's a true story, and Miles spends a lot of time talking about all the things that were in the sack and the sack itself. And she's got this whole section about Negro cloth. And she says, right in this book, that the two chief manufacturers of Negro cloth were in New England, the Lowell Mills and the Peastale Manufacturing Company. So I'm reading this book like, you know, a year or two ago. It just jumped out at me, right? We don't always think about that. We just think about, oh, they had this, this mill and they were manufacturing cruising cloth and whatnot, but that's where well, a lot of it was going. And Caroline sort of whitewashed uh, the whole idea of the slavery that was taking place in Robert Hazard's time. She said in, in one of her books that their, their condition was mild, a kind of serfdom rather than absolute slavery. Very easy for her to say, right? Really easy for, and she's relying on, um, she, she quotes somebody who is basically a slaveholder saying this, or somebody who's commenting um, from that sort of white European perspective. Uh, you know, I don't think if you ask the enslaved people that they would have said their condition was mild, right? So, so all of this is still going on when she's born, and the legacy of it continues through her lifetime. So she's, she is interested in basically four types of philanthropy. Education, which is a huge value for the hazards. They really valued education. The arts, her personal interest was in music and painting, uh, and also writing. Healthcare, you know, the biggest thing she left this community was South County Hospital. So you know, healthcare hugely, um, you know, just really hugely uh, impactful. Uh, and history and heritage. Gilbert Stewart birthplace, uh, you know, uh, Great Swamp Monument. We'll talk about some of these things. A lot of this was about preserving a certain legacy, often connected to the hazards themselves. So let's talk about education first. Now, even though Caroline was the president of Wellesley from 1899 to 1910, she did not have a college degree. Uh, and that wasn't really for lack of trying. Her brothers both went to Brown. Pembroke did not exist. Pembroke College did not exist at that point when she was of age to go to college. And so her father probably arranged this. She studied independently with J. Lewis Diamond, who is this, um, they call him a political economist, sort of a political science professor at Brown. He held this little salon in his home right until his death where um, Caroline and some, some other young women would, would you know, uh, they, they would have discussions about literature and, and about various readings that he would give them. And you know, it was a very, uh, she, she said she got a very good education. So it was kind of, it was kind of haphazard, right? She didn't, she didn't go to Wellesley, she didn't go to Pembroke, it didn't exist. She didn't have that college degree. Um, she did go to the, this Shaw School in Providence, which was probably, you know, she did study all the, you know, mathematics and whatnot, but it was probably a little more than a finishing school. 
Now, Caroline has a somewhat troubled adolescence, and a lot of this has to do with her health. First of all, she has this enormous growth spur when she's a teenager. She, uh, she was five feet 10 inches tall according to her passport applications. She may have even been a little tall. Sometimes we wouldn't fudge their height. So she was at least five feet 10 inches tall. And a lot of that height came very quickly. And so she had a lot of back trouble from that. And she took what was known as the lift cure. And this was in a gymnasium in Providence. I think it was probably a kind of physical therapy. It was a pretty mild kind of thing that she did. So she took this lift cure. Then she, she went, to, in 1876 to 1877, she went to Europe with her family, okay? Now she's you know, 21 years old. Uh, and she comes back and she's not well. And she's kind of mysterious in her autobiographical sketch that she wrote, in, um, in some of the books where she alludes to this. She's kind of mysterious about why wasn't she well. Well, a couple of things that happened while she was in Europe. She had been studying with um, a music teacher. She wanted to be a concert pianist. I think she realized that maybe either she didn't have the talent. She also had hurt her hand from practicing so much. She, the teacher had given her these really repetitive motion exercises. She might even have had tar carpal tunnel or something. Um, but I think she was reckoning with the fact that perhaps she wasn't cut out for this. And this had been her dream, to have some kind of career as a, as a pianist. So, so I think she might have come back depressed. She might have had some physical ailments. She might have had a relationship that we don't know about that didn't work out. There's no evidence about that, but that's something to think about. So what did they do? They put her to bed for four months. And they made her take the Mitchell Rest Cure. And this was a profoundly disabling uh, treatment that Dr. Silas Greer Mitchell had come up with. Basically, it was almost a punishment. If you were a woman and you were a mother and you were complaining about being depressed or whatever, his whole theory was, if you put somebody to bed and, and only feed them milk, they're going to get so bored and so disgusted, they're going to hop up and go back to cleaning house. I mean, that really was, I mean, I'm not exaggerating that much, okay? That really was the theory behind all this. Um, so, Charlotte Perkins Gilman famously wrote a short story about the rest cure called The Yellow Wallpaper, which is widely studied in colleges and anthologized. Uh, it's about a woman who has postpartum depression who's taking, um, you know, she's, she's being put to bed uh, and, and she refers to the Mitchell Rest Cure. The author, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, actually took the Mitchell Rest Cure when she had a postpartum depression. She went to Philadelphia and she was in bed, I think, for a month. It's highly unusual for someone to take this cure and to be in bed for this long. For one thing, the treatment was very expensive, okay? Um, and Charlotte could only uh, get enough money together to go for, say, a month. Uh, but the Hazards had a lot of resources, unfortunately, for, for Caroline. And she didn't take the cure with Dr. Mitchell. She took it with a, a surgeon named John G. Perry, who was a Civil War veteran, a Hazard doctor, based in New York City. From what I can tell, he mostly treated um, gynecological and obstetrical cases, which is kind of interesting. So what was really wrong with Caroline? Who knows? We don't know. But they put her in the Brunswick Hotel in New York City to bed. She had a nurse in an adjoining room. And this is this wonderful painting by Felix Valaton called The Sick Girl. And I saw this at the Metropolitan Museum a few years ago uh, in, in 2020. And I looked at it and I said, oh my god, that's Caroline. This is exactly her situation. She's the sick girl in bed who can't get out of bed. The nurse who's mobile, the nurse who doesn't have to stay in bed is coming in with her nightly hot milk or whatever, right, from the adjoining room. This was her circumstance. Could not get out of bed, had to use a bedpan. Four months, when Dr. Perry finally got her out of bed, she could barely walk. Jones couldn't walk because she had been bedridden for so long. Now. A few, a few months ago, I was in the hospital, and I had a pacemaker put in, rather surprisingly. And when you get a pacemaker, you have to stay in bed for 24 hours afterwards. You've got to use a bedpan, you can't get out of bed for 24 hours. I thought I was going to go out of my mind. It was going to be 24 hours. And I thought to myself, oh my god, four months she stayed in that bed. While well, all these things were going around her, if she had just let her loose in the city, there were plays happening and parties, and she needed to be stimulated. They probably didn't even let her read the newspaper, right? So I, I can't say what impact this had on her, but she mentions it in her autobiographical sketch that she wrote. And she says, I might not have been so cheerful about it if I'd known it was going to last four months. 
Now, her mother's aware that she needs something to do, right? Her, her brothers are off learning about the business. They're taking over the business from the father. You know, Frederick's going to go up to New York to do the Solvay Processing Company. And, um, you know, her brother Roland is going to uh, be involved with Keystone Manufacturing Company. She doesn't have anything to do. Her sisters are going to get married, right? But she, is, she doesn't marry. She doesn't have children. And she has this great mind. She's using her, and, and her mother writes to her husband. She finally says, you know, why don't you let her go through father's papers? And, you know, the, because the, the grandfather had just died. And she can sort of, you know, let her do that. And, and what comes out of this, she starts writing books. She writes the book College Toms. Um, uh, she writes uh, a book about Jay Lewis Diamond, the teacher that, that she had um, studied with. She writes a book of poem, poems called Narragans and Ballads. So she starts to get a name for herself. She's published by Houghton Mifflin. Um, and and this, is going to, this is going to lead somewhere for her. So she ends up president of Wellesley. And, and at first she turns it down. She has one thing to do with it, right? Um, her, her mother died in 1895, and her father followed three years later. And she was, she was very close to her parents. And this is all she has. She's living at home with them. And now they're gone. So I think she was very depressed. She was very upset. Um, and this opportunity comes along. And at first, she didn't want anything to do with it. And then gradually, she said, OK, but if you put one of my brothers in the board of trustees to advise me on financial matters, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, so she's 43 years old. At this point, she's written maybe four or five books. Uh, and now she has a chance to really show her executive ability. She brings in Rockefeller money. They build five buildings. They expand programs. They hire teachers. It's this incredible flowering of this women's college at Wellesley. And she's responsible for this. But she also, she doesn't, um, she's not always there. Now think about it. She's used to doing whatever the heck she wants to do. She wants to go to Santa Barbara for the winter. She goes to Santa Barbara. So she took, in 1907, she took a sabbatical to the, to the Mideast. Then she, she wrote a book about it. She came back. She gave a series of lectures um, to the students. She, one winter, she just went to Santa Barbara because she wasn't feeling well. I think she felt a little penned in by the job, um, even though she was very good at it. So educational philanthropy, a huge family value, a huge value of Caroline's. Uh, and they get involved in what they call Negro education. Joseph Linder Polly uh, is a black man. He comes north. He uh, befriends her brother. For a while, he's going to establish some sort of academy or college at Tower Hill. And that doesn't work out. But Caroline and her, her um, aunt Anna give him money to buy land and start this college. First, it was called the Georgia Technical and Bible College. I think it had many names over the years. Uh, eventually, the Hazards are going to give money to build almost every building on the campus. Um, so he establishes this, this college, by the way, still exists. It's part of the University of Georgia system, the state system. Um, and and they, he establishes this college in 1903 with, with hazard money. But their idea about, the, about this sort of education, they were not in favor of a liberal arts education for these African Americans. And her brother actually says, you do not take a good cotton picker and make him a bad poet, which is really well, the first time I read that. Um, in an article called The Perils of Accommodation, which is about how Holly had to sort of, um, you, know, you know, certain behaviors that he had to exhibit in order to get the money out of the hazards. And there's this sort of relationship that was maybe a little dysfunctional between him and the hazards. Um, they were not, you know, they were not necessarily uh, believing that these former slaves should be educated to the same degree they should be educated. No, they need to be trained to do a job who's vocational. Um, which is really too bad because uh, they didn't have the imagination or to realize that there were really no limits here, uh, unfortunately. So she continues to support this, um, you know, after she leaves Wellesley, she gives them money uh, to build this library, and they, they name it after her mother in 1934. There's always a string attached, right? You know, she loves naming things after her parents or her brothers. Um, and this particular library no longer exists on the campus. It was flooded out by Hurricane Alberta, which was this terrible floods in 1994. And they ended up building a different library with a different name on it, probably named after a donor. There was also a road that was named um, after, after you know, Hazard Way, it was called, in her honor. Uh, Holly, through, it, it, 
When she died, Holly wrote this incredible letter to all these newspapers across the country praising her for her support. But the relationship was not always, you know, it wasn't always 100%, I think. She also supported an industrial school for black students in uh, North Situate. That's what's pictured here. It was originally a Pentecostal college, and, and it became this. It started Providence, and then it moved to this, this site. She donated money to Lincoln University, another historically black college. She gave money to the Tuskegee Institute, um, the Roland Hazard Training School, which was part of the Albany, Georgia campus. I mean, she, uh, she really spread that money around. She, she put her money where her mouth was, so to speak. But there was also a limit to her largesse. After a while, she just, in the 1930s, she got very impatient with it. And she wrote several letters where she said, I'm not giving you any more money. She actually had her secretary underline this in the typed letter. I am not giving you any more money. The college really, so the, the state of Georgia had taken over this college at this point. She said, the college really belongs to the state, and the state must take care of its own. I have done far more than my share, which was true. But she was just getting kind of old and cranky at that point. I think she was in her, she was in her 80s. People were hitting her all the time. She had to be somewhat, I think she was probably thinking about her legacy. Uh, she had made out a will probably at that point. She wanted to leave something for her nieces and nephews. So I think she, she just realized that it had to at some point come to an end. And of course, she's also very involved in Stepping Stone Kindergarten, which her mother started on the Hazard property. Uh, and she was devoted to Stepping Stone. She interviewed the teachers. She was very involved in the hiring of the teachers. She built the, the building on Spring Street. Um, she, she would go, when she was in town, at, you know, in the summertime, she, or in the spring or the fall, before she went to Santa Barbara for the winter, she would go there twice a week to see the children. The children would come see her when she was at, um, uh, at this point, she might have been at Oakwood's, not at Scallop Shell. Uh, for her 80th birthday, all the children trooped over and gave her 80 red roses. And then she'd give them cookies and play the piano for them. She really loved children. Um, and she was really devoted to Stepping Stone. And, and um, you know, originally Anna Schlipstein, this German woman, had been on um, the teacher, brought this whole idea of kindergarten over here. Um, she takes it over when her mother dies in 1895. And then, uh, even though in her will it says she's giving it to the town, she actually turned it over in 1944 before she died. Um, and I believe she gave them, she, she endowed her, she left an endowment as well. So she's also interested in health care. And, this, and you know, this is a woman who had some health issues herself. And I think she, through her community involvement, she sees what the health needs of the community are. She's still a national figure when she leaves Wellesley. She gets involved. She wants to start this national health board. She, you know, this is, she is uh, famous enough where newspapers all across the country can put um, her name, Miss Hazard, in the headline. People know who she is, right, at this point. Uh, so she comes back to Peacedale. She builds the house scallop shell. Uh, she makes sure there's a garage. She gets a car. She's an early adopter. I, I believe she, she had a chauffeur both here and in Santa Barbara, but I think she also learned to drive herself. Um, and she gets, she gets involved in the healthcare needs of the community. Okay. But now then her brothers both die. Fairly young. Um, you know, they're, I think, in their 60s when they die. And this is really difficult for her. She was close to both of them. Um, first, Frederick passes in 1917, and then um, Roman Gibson passes on January 23rd, 1918. Um, and, and everything just sort of, the, the whole mill thing just sort of dissolves. They sell, they sell it off to the M.T. Stevens Company. I don't think she wanted to take it over. Um, so she gets involved in the Visiting Nurse Committee. And this is where I think the roots of South County Hospital are partly in you know, her involvement in the Visiting Nurse Committee. It was based at the Neighborhood Guild. And she would type up the Visiting Nurse notes for the newspaper once a week. Uh, you know, she'd say, oh, there's flu in town. Or you know, we saw X number of patients. We delivered them for babies. There was no hospital uh, in South Kingston at this point. Kent Hospital didn't exist um, you know, in Kent County. If you got sick, you had to go to Providence. And there was famously the case where the young man had appendicitis, they put him on the train, he died before he got to Providence. But that happened years before South County Hospital started. In fact, her own brother, I think Roland, also had appendicitis and also had to be operated on in their house on the table. That probably um, had more impact on her than the other case, which had happened a while before. But I think serving in this visiting nurse committee, she started to see the great need. Women were having babies at home. 
there were really sick, sick people who were being treated by visiting nurses, maybe a doctor dropping in once in a while, maybe they were post-surgery or whatnot, that, you know, today we would think, well, they really need to be in the hospital. So she could see the need. So the first mention in her little diaries of this is in August 1919. She talks about bringing about a possible hospital one of these days. And sure enough, the next month she's writing up the check to buy the Watson House on Kenyon Avenue. So they established this cottage hospital. She convinces Dr. John Paul Jones and his wife Carolyn to live at the hospital and basically work there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It becomes almost immediately apparent that they need a bigger facility. First of all, women start flocking to this hospital. They want to give birth at a hospital. They don't want to give birth at home, right? So, and you've got, you've got the nurses who are basically sharing the same bed and sleeping in shifts, you know, working, sleeping, working, sleeping. Dr. Jones is carrying patients up the stairs because they don't have an elevator. It's a house that they sort of retrofitted, right? Um, so she pretty quickly realizes, well, we need to do more, we need to do better. So in, in 1922, she really gets serious about, we need to raise money, we need to build a permanent hospital. And this is when the, the brick hospital that we know today, this is the roots of that. Now, for part of this time, she's in Santa Barbara, and she's sort of orchestrating this through telegrams and letters, sometimes on a daily basis to the architect. She hires Edward F. Stevens, a famous hospital architect. She hires Frank Angel, a sort of like architect to the hazards. They're not playing well together. She's trying to sort that out from afar. She's incredibly dedicated to making this work because she can see the big picture. So they finally begin construction in 1924. By November of 1925, it's dedicated. It opens at the end of that year, and the cottage hospital is closed. And it, 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 Beautiful building, well landscaped grounds, looks a little bit like, the landscaping is a little bit like a hospital in Newton, Mass, that she's probably familiar with. She always hires the best and the brightest to do these things. She made, she, she is, uh, she continues to be an honorary member of the board throughout her life. This picture the hospital gave me, I mean, it looks like it might be a religious, um, uh, this, uh, you know, I'm not sure what this pic, the context of this picture is, but this is, this is what she looked like during the time period when all this was going on. And she, she maintains an interest in the hospital for the rest of her life, even though she's not really able to. Uh, you know, she hires the first hospital superintendent. In the 20s, she's pretty active. But then as she gets older and she's spending more time in Santa Barbara, she's not as involved. Caroline was also very interested in the arts. This is, um, this is one of her paintings that's in piece, the Pistol Library Collection. She's actually a very fine painter. She took most of her inspiration from um, California, though. When she was in California, she would take these sketching and painting trips. She would go to Yosemite. She would go to Bakersfield. She went to the Salton Sea. Uh, she, I assume she's paint, either sketching and painting later or painting on plein air. You know, that's, that's what I would assume. But she loved these. It really fed her soul. Uh, she, had this, she had this really uh, strong feeling for the beauty of the world, and that helped her bring it out. I think she's a better painter than she was a poet. Um, and so this is a, a book she wrote. Uh, it was published in the 30s, but it's based on a trip she took to the Mideast on that sabbatical in 1907. And the frontispiece is one of her paintings. So her travels also inspired her art. Uh, the, the art critic for the Province Journal talked about her jewel-like tones. She loved these jewel-like colors in her paintings. Um, this is, this is um, in, uh, from A Brief Pilgrimage in the Holy Land, another book that she wrote. This is a painting of Mount Hermon in Syria. Uh, this was a pretty hefty trip that she took. I mean, I think they were riding on donkeys and, and, and whatnot. You know, they had guides. And um, so she really got to see a lot of the biblical sites that were important to her. <coughs> This is uh, from one of her uh, Christmas cards. Even in 1940, she continued to paint. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is courtesy Patty um, Martha Oliver Smith gave me this. She gave me some Christmas cards that um, Caroline sent out. Uh, it's just beautiful. This looks like a Western scene to me. Here's another one. This is a 1932 Christmas card. <coughs> and you can see you know, very simple subjects, fine line, beautiful color. Now, she was also, she, she exhibited every year in what would become the South County Art Association. And then in, in 19, 
was 1937, they had this show at the Guild. And basically, instead of showing original art like Caroline Granger sketches, they all sort of emptied the walls of their rich houses and, and exhibited these paintings. Two Matisse's, Diego Rivera, Charles Sheeler. I mean, these are, it was a Picasso in the show, at the Neighborhood Guild, right? <laughs> Incredible, right? And this is the painting that she contributed. This is a painting she owned by the Guatemalan artist Humberto Garavito. She, uh, uh, the, the promise girl called it the Weaver. Uh, and this is now in the collection of the Museum of Art and Culture in Keystone. They don't call it that. That might not have actually been its title. That, that's what the newspaper called it. You can see why she's interested in this. Like the Weaver, the sculpture that we'll talk about a little later, uh, you know, weaving had great significance for her because of the mill, the making of cloth. It had great symbolic significance to her. So she had quite an eye for collecting art. She owned a JMW Turner and a Ruskin that she left to Wellesley in her will. So she, she had some valuable art. Another interest of hers, of course, is preserving the family legacy and what she thought of as the heritage and history of South County. Okay? This is a picture of her dedicating a plaque um, about Samuel Sewell, who was a, a founder of the Quaker Church in South Kingstown. Uh, she was involved in a great many of these uh, dedications where they would put up a plaque or, or there would be you know, some sort of marker or map or whatever. But again, it's a little problematic because she's presenting one version of history. You know, she's, they're distancing, the Hazards are distancing themselves from slavery and its, and its impact. They sort of romanticize the European contact with the Narragansetts, as though the Narragansetts met with them, them with open arms. They saw everything their ancestors did as being beneficent, benevolent, good, right? Not always the case. Um, so she became very busy in sort of shoring up this legacy. She gets involved in North Kingstown in preserving the Gilbert Stewart birthplace. That was a big, um, you know, that's history plus art together, right? Two of her real, real loves. Um, I love this picture for this from the Province Journal. Um, I think this just this shows us how she dresses. You know, she's got that beautiful hat on. Um, she's got she, the, the line of her chin. She's a very strong woman, right? And it really comes through in this picture, I think. So she she writes poems about the Great Swamp Fight and various um, you know Indian legends that she had heard about. She belongs to the King's Daughters and the DAR. Uh, she you know she's dedicating plaques to various historical things that happen. Now, the Hazards donate the land for the Great Swamp Monument off Route 2 South County Trail. Um, was it theirs to donate is a philosophical question. It didn't originally belong to the family, obviously. Um, and in 1939, the, the Great Swamp Monument is, is erected. In Anchors of Tradition, one of her books, she goes on this drive around Charleston and South Kingston, and she goes to the Narragansett Indian Church. And it's like she's discovered this ancient relic that she didn't know was there, right? And it doesn't occur to her, I think, that, that Narragansett is still worshiping at the church. You know, it, it, to her, this is all stuff that happened in the past, but it's not in the past. Um, so she can stand next to Princess Redwing at this, an event dedicating the Great Swamp Monument without really considering that this tribe is still um, here, right? <laughs> These are real people. This tribe still exists. And mind you, it's all kind of in the past. Probably the best, the, the, probably the most beautiful uh, and lasting monument she left is the Weaver, which is outside um, Hazard Memorial Hall. Uh, built by, you know, Daniel Chester French is the, is the sculptor, you know, the Lincoln Memorial fame. Uh, Henry Bacon is the architect that does the grading and, and builds the base of it. Uh, just, a, you know, she wrote the whole poem, um, which I, I don't know by heart, but she's the whole inscription, something that she wrote with a little help from her sister Helen. Um, and it's dedicated in memory of her father and her brothers. And it, it's really quite an amazing thing that we have this in, in our town, that we have a Daniel Chester French in our town. I want to talk a little bit, this is sort of a little bonus content. I want to talk about her later years because they're very interesting and I've done a lot of research about this. This is a, I don't think this photo of Caroline has been shown publicly before, not to my knowledge. This, I believe, is her standing on the porch uh, at Mission Hill in Santa Barbara. You can't really see her face very well, but you can see tall woman, 
straight carriage, wearing almost a wedding gown, this beautiful white dress. She was a 19th century woman living in the 20th century. She was still sort of in that Victorian era in mind. She's a very conservative person, right? Um, now, as late as 1941, she's still going back and forth between Peacedale and um, Santa Barbara. But then, after you know, after Pearl Harbor, travel becomes more difficult because of you know rationing and whatnot. She doesn't. I think 1941 was the last time that she was here, and the rest of the time she spent in Santa Barbara. Um, now, she also had what I think is probably one of the most defining relationships of her life later in life, and that is when she met a woman named Patience Adams. And we know about this because we have Patience Adams' letters to Caroline, which I have read them all. They are an amazing uh, insight into Caroline, into her same-sex relationship with women, uh, and, and also a record of what was happening in the UK during the war. Now, Patience Adams was, she was acquainted with um, Betty Sturgis, and, and I don't know how she met her. She's from England, but she was, she was friendly with um, Betty and Mark Sturgis, and that's how Betty must have said to her, um, this is, this is um, Caroline's niece, she must have said to her, you know, Caroline's out there in Santa Barbara, she really, she needs a secretary, she needs a companion, would you be willing to go out there? And so she's hired on um, for three winters, 36, 37, and 38, to work as her sort of companion slash secretary. In fact, I believe that they had a love relationship. It's pretty clear from the letters that they were, they were lovers. Um, Patience was uh, never married, single woman. I believe this is a picture of Patience. I can't prove that. There's nothing written on it. It, it definitely conforms to how Patience talked about herself in her letters. She used to wear tweed skirts. Um, you know, she dressed a little differently from Caroline. Uh, it, it, just, just the age of this woman. You know, she was younger. You know, she was born 1879. She's younger. She's in her, you know, in her 50s at this point. Um, so she was from Blueberry, England. Her father was a barrister. I think she had an independent income. And so she works those three winters, and then in 19, September 1939, England and Germany go to war, and she can't travel anymore. This is Patience's home in Blueberry, England. Uh, which somebody from that village sent me. Doesn't look like much, it looks like they made it into a duplex, but it's very typical of these old brick English homes. She lived there during the war. The, the rationing of coal was such that the house was never more than 45 or 50 degrees at any time. She was freezing all the time. And uh, early, in 1939, she takes in, she takes in a bunch of, um, <laughs> I have to read this. She takes in a bunch of uh, orphans from London because uh, they were sending all the children out to the country, right? And so she writes to Caroline, and this is, you know, she's just seen, at this point she's just seen Caroline, she came back in the spring of 1939 from spending the winter there. She says, having little slum children will be awkward. And then she says, I must say, the thought of slum children all over the house does curdle one's blood. <laughs> so she wasn't exactly a willing, a warm welcomer of these poor kids. She had, she had four boys, and she's constantly writing to Caroline, complaining about these boys that are running around her house and whatnot. She's a very stern disciplinarian. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of little stories in these letters that are, that are very insightful to that period of time. She also, Patience was also virulently anti-Semitic and would go on these anti-Semitic rants, which I really wonder what Caroline thought about. I do know that Caroline sort of caught her up short and scolded her about things sometimes because you can tell by Patience's reaction. But there's a, there's a great deal of um, sort of love letter material in these letters. Uh, in, in October 1939, she says, darling, I do love you, and I'm taking your letter to bed with me as I always do. Um, you know, she, she, she frequently, Let's see if I have another. No, I guess I didn't write that other one down. She, she frequently writes about, you know, um, remember that trip we took, uh, that painting trip, remember when I was in your arms, and you know, I, it's clearly they had some kind of physical relationship. Um, at some point they realized they're never gonna see each other again. So what are love letters? They, they have three tenses, past, present, future. The, the lovers talk about what they did when they saw each other. They talk about what they're doing now that they're apart. They talk about what they're going to do when they get together again. And that's kind of what Patience's letters were like. Unfortunately, Caroline's letters to Patience have not been located. They might be in the UK. I haven't been able to find them. 
Um, she might have eventually destroyed them. She had not destroyed them at the time of the writing of these letters, but she might not have wanted. Um, she had a niece and two nephews. She might not have wanted them to see them. At one, she, at one point, she tells this story where they're in Santa Barbara and, and sitting in the living room by, by the fire. And Caroline turns to her and says, I was just thinking how happy you made me. It was very good of the dear Lord to give you to me towards the end of my life. And it's just a really just wonderful little passage. And it, it lets us know that Caroline is at peace, I think, with the fact that she's probably in the last years of her life. And, and this has made her happy. And I think her life was not always happy. So it's kind of a nice little coda uh, to what was probably sometimes a struggle in her life. She, she has either a heart attack or a stroke in October of 1944. She dies on March 19, 1945, at home in Santa Barbara. This is her gravestone at Oakdale. Um, since, that, those are my son's hands, like brushing away. He saw it and brushing away the dirt. When we saw it, this was in 2020, I think. It was covered, it was buried. We had to, and, and ironically, the woman who had the New York Times obituary, her grave was like fallen, the stone was fallen and forgotten. But since then, um, uh, apparently a civil war group or somebody came in and they have put the stone back up again and cleaned it up. So that's really good to know. So that's all I have. Um, thank you all. <laughs>